Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Van Sturgeon. Van is a real estate investor, a home builder, renovator, general contractor, and a high performance coach with over 30 years of experience in the real estate industry. He's a real estate investor who is semi-retired, but enjoys helping people figure out the whole real estate investment strategy. Uh, Van is an expert in renovations. Uh, and he lays out many things as a general contractor that you need to know as the operator when working with general contractors. But from the goal, from the, pr- the process of having a goal and maybe the, the difficulty of that, but the, what happens when you don't have a goal, uh, all the way down to the having the scope of work and the details that need to be in that scope of work, You know whether you're remodeling a duplex or whether it's a 200 unit apartment building. So he lays out many details that, that are going to be very helpful to you. So you're prepared to have a successful renovation project. Van, welcome to the show. I know you have an amazing background and and experience in many aspects of real estate that many of our listeners are going to need to know more about as well. So give us a little more about your background, how you got to where you're at now and just this skill set and let's jump in. Well, I, I'm a product of the 1960s, and uh, I, I uh, grew up in, uh, uh, in Chicago, um, and uh, my family and I lived in a one-bedroom apartment, and um, my parents had the, you know, the dream, like everybody has, about uh, getting enough uh, money together to be able to buy their first, uh, for their first home, their first dream home, and in the process of doing that, they discovered that the apartment building they're living in had gone up for sale, so instead of actually buying uh, uh, their home, they decided to become landlords. So they put a, they borrowed from friends and family and put enough scratch down to put a down payment to take over to purchase this apartment building. And um, so that that was that that's how I entered into into real estate as a as a kid. And uh, when they took over, it happened during the nineteen the late nineteen seventies, where uh, when they purchased the building it was fully occupied. And right there at the cusp of the late nineteen seventies, things things started to turn around. You had uh, you know things like. Uh, I remember having to wait in line for gas. There was a gas shortages and the ran hostage situation. There was inflation rate uh, was was bonkers. Like uh, it was it was a miserable time. So this apartment building that was fully occupied, all of a sudden over over that late seventies, early eighties, started to vacancy rate started to jump up on us, and to the point where it was it was forty to sixty percent vacant during that period of time. Wow. So as a so as a family, we had a we had to buckle down. We had a, we had a, this is our sole investment and we had to do everything that was associated with the actual apartment uh, in terms of renovations and looking after things we had to do ourselves um, as a family. So whether that's painting, doing roof repairs, replacing, changing windows, carpet, you name it, we did everything ourselves to save money. And so it's from that background that we went through the, uh, through the eighties. And then I went off to university, graduated, and then I had an opportunity to become a lawyer, and I, I decided against that, against my parents' wishes. You know, every parent's dream is to have their kid, you know, walk around with a suit and tie and that kind of stuff, be a lawyer or a doctor. And I walked away from that. I said, I really was passionate, really enjoyed, really wanted to get into renovations and general contracting. So I opened up my general contracting business in Chicago. Um, it was a good period of time in the early nineties, uh, late eighties, early nineties. And, and I, I just started going out there on the hustle and, uh, tr- slowly grew my business networking, but I kept, uh, with me, I kept saying the same cats, the same individuals, uh, out there, the, you know, these real estate investors who were flipping properties or purchasing, you know, uh, you know, adding to the rental portfolios. And, uh, that sort of exposed, exposed me to that other side of the, that, that side of the business. And that's where I started to, uh, branch off into doing my own flips. And, uh, because of the background I had in renovations and construction, uh, things sort of escalated. And, um, so I have a thriving, I have uh, businesses in the, in real estate industry that are for property management development, um, like land acquisition. And, uh, I've got a portfolio of properties. I have over a thousand uh, doors uh, spread out over four four areas. So I've been very blessed. I'm very thankful for everything that I've been able to accomplish over the last over 30 years. And 
Right now, I'm at the stage of my life where I'm kind of semi-retired. I've got some really great people in terms of either partnerships or employees that are running everything. And I really want to give back. I, 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 I see it often the biggest obstacle, not biggest, but one of the biggest obstacles that new real estate investors, whether you're on the syndication side, what, whatever, whatever facet, is the whole renovation side of the business, you know, like trying to, because we're all looking for that ugly duckling. We're all looking for that diamond in the rough to get the deal. The deal doesn't come out with a nice little bow tie. The deal comes in overgrown shrubs and, you know, lime green carpet from the 1970s, that kind of real estate deal where you got to get in there and you got to roll up your sleeves. You got to do something to raise a value, you know, lift up the rents perhaps. And so that whole process is a process. It's a system that you need to understand and know in order for you to be successful. If you don't have a system in place, what ends up happening is you sputter here and you sputter there and you end up losing, losing a lot of money. And I've seen people being devastated financially and emotionally by taking on, ta- you know, getting into the real estate industry, trying to become, getting into real estate investment and they fall because they don't know how to carry out what a renovation or rehab, whether it's, on their own, or whether it's hiring a, G- a GC, you got to know. And I'm and I'm speaking here as a general contractor myself. You got to know how to plan and manage and how to deal with contractors and tradespeople. So that's where I'm here. Uh, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm I'm out there spreading the good word. I really uh, I really feel sorry for. I really feel badly for people when they start off and they lose such control over their investments. And I want to be able to help them and put a system in place. Yeah. Let's do, let's discuss that in a big way. I wanted to ask you though, before we do that, uh, do you all still own that property you bought in the seventies? Yes, actually we still do. It's out in, uh, it's on the North side of Chicago and uh, it's been a phenomenal investment. Uh, you cannot ever lose in real estate. You know, I, I, I've got a diverse portfolio, whether it's a real estate and stocks and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, hey man, you can't beat good old real estate. You can't beat it. It's incredible. No, I just wondered if you all still had it. I would imagine you wouldn't want to sell it now after having it that long. <laughs> right. No, that's awesome. And, and it's just neat too how, you know, you at a young age, how you were influenced over those, say, 10 years or so uh, just by your role and, and how the family, you know, worked that property and made it happen, right? Even through those difficult times, you said 40 to 50% vacancy. And you all all came together to to keep it running and operating. Sounds like uh, you know in a big way to save all the money that you could. Uh, any anything you want to speak there to to how how that shaped you? How that even at a young age or anything that even parents listening right now could you know get how they could get their children involved in real estate? Well, you know it, uh, it, it's a uh, it, it's a it's a it's a positive and a negative. The positive obviously is that uh, it gives you it exposes you to what you can do, and it, it exposes you to the proper mindset that you have to get into to be able to move into whether it's real estate or whether opening your own company. You really got to roll up your sleeves, and you really got to get into the weeds, and you got to put in the hard work and effort to be able to be successful. So, and sometimes just, just by virtue of necessity, you had to, we, uh, our family out of necessity had to do what we had to do. If we, I'm sure my, my father really would have loved to at that time with a fully occupied building, just pick up the phone and call the painter or pick up and call the electrician. But when you got 40, 50, 60% vacancy, and I remember as a kid walking through the <laughs> building and vacant, 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 and you just walk in apartments and there, there's nobody there. Uh, you know, it's a pretty, I don't know how they got through with it because it's, it's really me as an investor now looking back on it. Wow. You know, being having that kind of vacancy and having, you know, having that around your neck, it's pretty troubling. Now, that being said, that, that mindset is great, but I, uh, in my evolution as a real estate investor, as a successful business owner, I had to get away from that mindset eventually because when you, when you get to the point when you want to scale, when you go on to get into that 20, 50, 100, 300 you know, door portfolio, you got to get out of the mindset where I was in, where I was a micromanager. I had to do everything myself because I was the best. And I got, and I, in my process, I hit a wall where I was running a successful general contracting business. It was growing and thriving. I was also doing a lot of this real estate flipping and buying, and, and then I was burning a candle at both ends. I remember, you know, I was, I got married, I was recently married. I didn't even go on my honeymoon. I, I was so focused on my business that, uh, that, and it got to, it came to a head where I was sleeping at job sites and, and, uh, and I, and I knew that this was the wrong way. And I reached out to a, a, a real estate investor who happened to be also a coach, right? Where, I, where I, I, I helped, he helped me put, you know, put the systems and process in place and it, 
And that investment was what really drove me and spurred me to be, to reach the heights that I've reached. Now that's so awesome. Mindset. So yeah. mindset is really important in both of those sides. So it could be positive and also it could be negative in that you can't be a micromanager. You got to see the bigger picture and you got to move on and you got to grow as an individual. Yeah. Let's all learn from that. He didn't, he didn't even go on his honeymoon and he was sleeping at job sites. So it's, we do not want to be there. Right. Uh, and we need those systems. We need those processes. And I like how you said, it's, it's a mindset and it is right? when you can really think about, Hey, let's build a process and a system here versus uh, just trying to go get it done. I kind of randomly uh, with no system in place. And it's a very different thought process. Well, help us with that. Let's jump in, you know, renovations, obviously your specialty and many of us are renovating hundreds of units at a time. Uh, you know, in one form or fashion, trying to manage those, uh, you know, the tradesmen and, and general contractors and, and all kinds of people, right, that we need on our team. Well, get us started a little bit on how you've built that successful just system and how you're helping others do that. Well, it starts with uh, setting out a goal. And, and that goal is uh, y- you need to actually physically write it down on a sheet of paper what it is you're looking to accomplish with this particular property. So if you're looking to flip it, how much money you're looking to sell it for or make? If you're looking to rent it out, how much you're looking to get? So uh, in the uh, in the syndication or apartment building kind of multifamily kind of sphere, if you're looking to raise rents from eight hundred to nine hundred, eight hundred to twelve hundred dollars, you need to fi- you need to write that goal out. And once you have that goal, then you got to get out in the marketplace and validate that goal. You got to go and look at comparable properties out there to figure out and understand what it is that you need to p- do with that particular unit. In order to be able to get those types of rents and be really, you got to be really honest with yourself about what it is you can realistically get. I see a lot of times new real estate investors will walk in and think that, you know, they can sprinkle a bunch of new things and spend lots of money in a particular unit and not get that kind of rent because you can't, there's a difference between 500 square feet and 1200 square feet. As much as many do that as I can sprinkle on that 500 square foot apartment, I can't get a tw- I can't get the same amount of rent of tw- that a 1200 square foot apartment can. So we have to be realistic in what we can. We got to validate. Mm. But then once you get in there, then you got to you got to figure out what your budget is and there's there's a uh, budget in terms of where the source of funding is going to come. And oftentimes a lot of folks struggle with that because you know, we only have so much cash in the kitty. And so we need to get out there and find other forms of of money and you know, there's a traditional sources, of course, going out to your local you know, financial institution, establish some sort of a line of credit or a loan. But there's also other options that a lot of folks aren't uh, that aren't exposed to, to in terms of hard money lenders and, and other bodies. There's also government uh, government grants sometimes that you can tap into. Like in one particular property, I, I had the municipality reach out to me saying that, you know, the, because the property was in a floodplain, they're going to give me X amount of dollars in terms of improvements that I can make to my property with the, with the sanitary storm surge, you know, weeping tile, that, things of that sort. So you got to look at all those sources to be able to put a comprehensive plan together and budget. And then you move on to, you know, so once you understand what it is, how much money you have, you got to then go through the actual property and create what, what I call a needs and wants list. And what, what that is, is uh, a need is something that needs to happen, needs a repair. So if you have a, 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 if you got a leaking roof, that's a need. You can't sort of brush that off. Um, a want is something like, uh, you know, that, that shaggy green carpet from the 1980s where, you know, it's, 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 it's ugly, it's hideous, you want to get rid of it. But if it's still, you know, functional, if it's still, if, if you know, it's not a trip hazard, then that's something that's a want that you would like to be able to replace and if there's monies in the budget to do that, great. But if there isn't, then you, you leave that alone. Um, once you've established that, you understand what it is that uh, you got, what you need uh, and what your wants are. Really, the biggest one, uh, Whitney, that, I, that folks miss is the creation of a scope of work. Now, I don't, like a lot of folks out there, on the, definitely on a residential side, in fact, on the residential side, it's non-existent. Um, I come from, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a general contractor. That's that's where my bread and butter was. I had, and always has been. I love general contracting. And I've seen, I've literally gone through, done thousands of renovations from apartments all the way to office buildings. One of the things that I find that on the commercial side, there is hardly ever a project that's ever provided uh, that's tendered out that doesn't come with a scope of work. Where you have a detail that what a scope of work is for listeners out there is an actual document that provides the detailed specifications and and the 
processes associated with what that renovation, which wall gets removed, which appliances are specified, the hardwood, the tile, everything is put in that document so that whenever you tender it out to a general contractor or you tender it out to individual trades where you act as a general contractor, where you're hiring an electrician, a painter, the plumber individually, you have a body of work. You have a document that everything is based off of. One of the difficulties, especially on the residential side, there isn't that document that's created. And it's just merely grabbing a contract or a GC and walking through a property and pointing at things saying, yeah, I want to do this and I want to do that. Do you know how many different types of, how many, you know, how many different types of toilets there are? There's a hundred dollar toilets or a thousand dollar toilets. See how many different types of paint quality there is or types of paint? Unless we invent a process where I can crawl into your head as an investor and figure out exactly what it is that you want, it's always destined for problems. And that's the reason why our industry, the contractor industry, has got such a bad name. You know, you, we all see the DIY shows and, you know, the, the, the disasters and, you know, there's a whole channels dedicated to this kind of stuff where contractors, these bad contractors, and there's a lot of bad contractors out there. But there's also a lot of bad principal, a lot of bad owners, a lot of bad people. They Not bad in terms of, net, you know, it's just, they're not prepared. They, they, and that's the reason why we have such a, this, such a difficulties out there is because we don't have clear lines of understandings of communication, understand what it is that we're trying to accomplish in this particular renovation project. Get your free copy of A Guide to Passively Investing in Commercial Real Estate. Inside, you'll learn the basics of passive income and real estate syndication, what kind of returns you can expect, how to find a sponsor, and how to evaluate the risks. Download your copy in the show notes or visit lifebridgecapital.com forward slash invest better to start your investment journey. You know, let's talk about the scope of work a little bit. I appreciate you elaborating on that and how, yeah, most people and a lot of listeners may be thinking, oh, wait a minute, you know, Van, I'm not qualified to do a scope of work. I don't know which wall needs to be removed. I don't know which paint is the best or or which toilet we should really purchase, you know, do I need that thousand dollar tool? Most likely not. But, but, you know, just say, you know, like they may be thinking about, well, how do I even begin a scope of work to be that detailed or do I hire somebody? Do I have the general contractor help me do that? What does that process look like? Well, I mean, you, uh, you could always hire the further general contractor, but the issue is that what, are, what, what is your, how do you compare apples to apples? Unless you have some type of a document that you can give a general contractor to three, five, seven general contractors for them to be able to price out the same thing. And the scope of work of creating it, yeah, it's not an easy process. And you have to have experience. You have to have a, ba- you know, you've got to have a knowledge to be able to create that document, but it, it's, it is doable. If you do the research on, uh, you have to do it one way or another. You have to figure out what type of hardwood floor you want to install in that particular unit or laminate floor or the type of cut paint. And if you expect a general contractor to do that for you, he can or she can, but you're going to pay for that. And, and speaking as a general contractor, you know, I, I, I just to give you an example, and you can then extrapolate from that. If I were to come to you, Whitney, and said, I'm going to charge you $50,000 for this renovation to your property, whatever that is. My profit margin on that, for me to spend two, three months on that particular home of yours that you're, you know, I, on $50,000, my profit margin has got to be ten dollars to $15,000. I need to make that kind of money as a GC, the supervisor over a course of two, three months, I need to make that kind of money. So what I'm saying is, uh, if you want to save that kind of money and really learn a new skill set also in being able to then f- handle future renovations or handle future purchases and have that background to be able to walk into properties and understand what you need and how much, how long it'll take and how much it'll cost, then I think you need to do that. And, and that's one of the reasons why I have a competitive advantage over many, many other real estate investors is I'm able to walk into any property in North America and be able to survey the scene and have a good sense of how long it's going to take and how much is it going to cost. And I can make an instantaneously, I can make a decision whether I can make a deal on the spot with that, with the, with the owner of that particular property or not. Is that pretty powerful stuff? That is powerful for sure. So with regards to a scope of work, if you want to put in the time and effort to do your due diligence and figure out all this stuff, you can, and, and then you create, and then you create that document that you have to have a basis to be able to do comparisons, whether you do the renovation yourself or you sub it out to a general contractor. You have to. That's 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 where uh, sophisticated real estate investors 
like yourself, Whitney, I'm sure when you're looking at you systemize things, you have to, you don't have systemized, if you don't have systems, if you don't have systems, you, you're, 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 you're always into uniques. You're always into unique and unique can take you down some really you know, difficult rabbit holes. And how can you improve? Uh, how can you even know if you're improving if you don't have a documented system? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and I know that there are successful real estate investors that have know exactly the type of toilet that they put in, the type of paint, the color of the paint. Everything is systemized so that all you got to do is spit it out. And you have, a, you have a collection of contractors or tradespeople that know exactly what they're supposed to deliver time and time again. It's just cookie cutter. Boom, boom, boom. But before you get to that point, you got to have that scope of work. You got to have that body to be able to get there, uh, to get to that point. And you make it with improv- you know, improvisations along the way to perfect it, but you have to have that document. Well, I like how you just started though with a goal too. And I think some of that, that goal should begin before we even purchase the property, right? Like what is your goal with this property? You, know, you talk about what is your budget? You should be thinking about those things before you ever, ever put the offer in. Uh, and then, you know, your needs and wants list, hopefully you do know a lot of that through due diligence, right? And then this creating the scope of work and it's such great, uh, I mean, a tip to do that. Uh, anything after that or anything that helps you to think through this process or, you know, do you just create a master checklist? How, how do you do that now or recommend others do that so they don't make big mistakes? I really, well, uh, one of the things that I keep finding out there is this, is this propensity to, especially nowadays, because everybody's so busy, is that um, folks run out there and give these huge deposits and, and they are constantly paying more money than there should be to their contractors and tradespeople. And what, create, and what, what, what ends up creating is a situation where contractors who are busy, there's only a certain period of time during the year that they're busy, they're humming, they're moving, they're grooving. If they've already received more money than they're supposed to on a particular project and they go to another project where they, that isn't the case, where are they going to go do their, where are they going to go work? They're going to go work where they, where money is owed instead of a place where money has already been. So one of the things I recommend to people as a hint and I'm speaking as a general contractor mm-hmm. is to try to preserve as much of the money as possible in terms of the duration of the contract. This is really a frank conversation you have with that electrician, with the general contractor saying, okay, uh, your particular pro- job is going to cost, let's say $50,000. Okay. So from, it's going to take three months. Great. What are the milestones that we're going to hit so that we release funds? What are the milestones we're going to hit that we're going to release, release more funds and make sure that at the end of the kitty, at the end of the job, there's sufficient amount of money to ensure that that contractor trace people finish because oftentimes what we find, and again, speaking as a general contractor, is it's all great and good in the beginning. You're moving, you're getting things done, and you're at that 90% mark in that renovation, that rehab. And it's the last 5%, 10% are the most difficult. You can see the light under the tunnel. Whitney, you can see it. But it's a caulking here, and it's a little piece of trim over there, and it's a piece of carpet that's got to be replaced. And these small little things that add up to a lot of time and effort, contractors and trades people want to skip out on. But if you have monies in hand that you owe them, trust me, they'll show up and go complete it. And oftentimes <laughs> I find that uh, a lot of uh, folks don't do that. And they, sh- and they scratch their heads wondering why, where, what happened to this contractor? How come he doesn't come? Well, he doesn't come because you've already paid him too much money. The only place that I pay money up front before something is delivered is McDonald's with me. When I go to McDonald's, I, I give them my money. And I order my hamburger and I step back, I wait for the hamburger to be produced and they give it to me. None of these contractors and trace people are at McDonald's. So be very careful and diligent in the amount of money you shell out to be able to have control over your renovation. I got lots of, there's a lots of things that you need to do as a, as a real estate investor from inserting clauses in particular agreements that you have with, with GCs or trace people to ensure, give you another hint. Like well, recently what happened uh, was uh, one of my clients hired a painter to do the next year painting on the on their property. And as they're spraying the property, his spray mist ended up on the neighbor's car. Now who's responsible for that, Whitney? If unless you have a some type of clause within your agreement that says, hey, if you cause damage to my property or somebody else's, I'm able to deduct monies from your pay to be able to offset the costs associated. If you don't have that, you can't just arbitrarily take the side to take money away from that contractor because of the damage they cause. Because that's that's they they have the right to put a lien on your property if you do that. You can't just withhold monies. So these are the types of things that you need to put in to protect yourself. 
especially such when a you great, get into that. Yeah. Such a great point. Like having some type of contract with the general contractor. This is what's expected. This is what's going to happen. This is how you're going to be paid. If you damage something, this is what's going to happen then. Uh, it's so smart, right? I think most people hire a general contractor and never think about actually having a contract between you two uh, of what's going to happen. Who should have that contract? Is that something you should come up with? You should go to your attorney uh, to have something drafted. How, what do you suggest there? Well, I mean, the, 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 I, I, I've been doing this for a long time as a general contractor and as a real estate investor, I have those co- agreements and contracts in place. Typically, uh, the general contractor should be the one that should be providing you the document, and then you got to review it. If you have a scope of work, you got you will make sure that the scope of work becomes an adenum to that actual general that that contract that's presented to you, whether it's by the GC or electrician or plumber. And you got to read through that agreement, and, and that does not necessarily mean that you sign off on it. Because I'm sure that the, the agreement is going to be one side. It's going to protect them. So these are the types of things that you need to be able to keep in mind to insert on either your scope of work or on the actual agreement itself. So that there's an understanding. Again, w- contractors are not bad people. Uh, trace people are not bad people. It's a matter of having clear lines of communication and having an understanding and you knowing what you're doing. Like I love working with professionals. Everybody wants to work with professionals. And I have my successes as a general contractor, as a real estate investor, was dealing with other professionals. And one of the, uh, one of the things that I'm finding, especially now in this heated real estate market where everybody's renovating and running around and like chickens with their heads cut off, is that, oh, I call a GC up. Oh, I call an electrician up and they're not returning my phone call. I just had that recently with a, with a client that said, I don't know why I called 23 contractors and, none, and only four showed up before only four returned my phone call. Well, the reason is because you just... You don't, you're not professional. You don't have a scope of work. You don't have something that you've emailed them. You haven't said, hey, this is what I want accomplished. This is what I want done. If you provide something like that, immediately you're elevating yourself from everybody else because I'm one of the other professional. I want to be can't, can't blame them for wanting to work with professional clients, right? Uh, and that knows that knows the routine and has their act together and has a plan, right? Uh, as as a general contractor, I'm sure after, especially after you're in the business a few years, you can see very quickly who's prepared and who's not, and all the headaches that you're going to have with somebody who has no plan, right? All the time wasted, all the questions, all those things that you know take time out of your day that ultimately you're you're not being paid for. Right. And so yeah, I can I can the, completely understand working with professional. What will you speak to the the milestones of payments you were talking to? Is there any guidance there uh, of how you would do that? You mentioned like a fifty thousand dollar project, say over three right. months. How, how should the listener think through that? Uh, you know, paying them, you know, the general contractor along the way, but obviously having maybe a lump sum at the end. Well, I definitely at the end you should have a minimum ten to fifteen percent that you should be out uh, owing, and that would be the whole back associated with making sure that your contract or trace people uh, uh, have paid their employees, you know that kind of thing. That's that's what usually, and then you know that also money should be held back for the amount that, for making sure that everything is completed uh, on your project. But I mean, every it's every situation is unique depending on you know if you're going to hire a carpenter as an example where they have to produce supplies in order for them to start. If they're if you're going to have them purchase the material, then you need to give them more money as a deposit because you're going to use that toward the material. Um, versus if it's just a you know a painter who's going to show up where you know the material is is, is insignificant. But you need to structure it in a fashion and or in a way. That you services are rendered, and then you get, then you pay. Services are rendered, then you pay, and not the other way around. Because if you have it the other set up the other way around, you lose control of that individual. It's natural. It's natural. Trust me, as a general contractor, I'm telling you that if I have five jobs on the go, and if there's three jobs that I'm already I'm I'm fat, meaning I've got enough, I've got more than enough cover my expenses, all that kind of stuff. But I got two jobs that are lean, meaning I got to do work in order to get paid. I'm and I want to get paid. I'm going to go to those two jobs if I got to balance. If I got to you know if I got to juggle things around, I got to go there. And so it's natural for you if you want to make sure that contractors, trades people are on time, on budget, that you got to control them. You control them with money. Unfortunately, that's the only way you can control them. You can't put a gun to their head. You got to control in that way, right? <laughs> a lot of us aren't controlled by money too too often, I think, or too much. But uh, no, great points. I mean, just amazing, some great tips, no doubt about it. Anybody that's looking to get in any part of the real estate business, uh, you need to have a plan, a goal, a scope of work, thinking through those things, and and really building that relationship with the general contractor on a professional 
basis. It, it goes so far, no matter if it's the general contractor, the plumber, or an investor, it's, yeah, it'd be professional uh, and understand your your role in being professional in that. Uh, so, Van, uh, switching gears just a little bit while we just have a couple minutes left. Uh, what about uh, any daily habits that you have that you are disciplined about uh, that have helped you achieve success? Bob, you, I, I, again, as part of my life is uh, getting into systems. So uh, I have that through my day. So right now I, I have a set of period of time when I wake up. I have a set period of time that I spend uh, for myself, meaning in med- meditation. And then, and, then I, and then I move through the day with having certain, I establish goals. I constantly establish goals throughout the day and I reach my goals. If you don't have goals, and you write them down. Some you need to maybe sometimes get to the point where you write it down. You never get to those goals. If it's just haphazard, I want to do this or I want to answer a couple of emails. If you don't have an actual goal, you're never going to get to that point. So that's how I structure my life. And I recommend people, you need to get into systems. And it's, life becomes so much easier when you do, when you have that. If you don't have a goal, you're never going to reach it. I like that. Uh, what yeah. about the number one thing that's contributed to your success? I, I, I think that the number one thing that contributed to my professional success in terms of being a successful real estate investor has been at the early stages of my development, reaching out at that time where I touched on the beginning, uh, having that mentor, having that coach. I spent a lot of money and I've continued to spend money, Whitney, uh, over the last 30 years. I, I must have spent over $200,000 in, in you know, coaching and mentorship and, and retreats and books and you name it, I've done it. And the success that I am today is a result of all of that, all of that. It's like, it's akin to trying to learn how to play a, a musical instrument, like a guitar. Like you can grab, anybody can grab a guitar, start strumming it and try to figure it out. And maybe in a couple of years, you might figure it out. But wouldn't it be nice to just to hire a, a guitar teacher who sits right next to you, shows you how to hold it, how to do it, how to play it. Wouldn't you learn a lot quicker? Wouldn't it be a lot more enjoyable? Wouldn't you see success a lot quicker and keep you away? And in our business, our business is really is a lot of money that's involved. And I've seen, and I'm sure you have, Whitney, where people have got in and gotten cleaned out. Their clock has been rung and they've been devastated by the wrong decision, wrong move. It wouldn't it be nice to have somebody there beside you to be able to show you the way, to help you along in that process, keep you away from making that devastating mistake? Because we're dealing with hundreds or perhaps millions of dollars here. I, I think that I strongly encourage people, if you really want to be you really want to up your game. You really want to be successful. Go find somebody who's done it and copy. No doubt about it. And it's no secret, right? It's no secret. I, mean, I completely agree about having a mentor. I've also had many mentors. And often when I'm trying to learn something new, hey, it's like, who's the best at that? I want to go talk to them, right? I want to go learn from that individual. Uh, it speeds that process up drastically, gives you a just... Uh, confidence that you never would have had before having that person on your side as well. Uh, and I, I mean, I can see that in people I'm mentoring now as well. I mean, it's just neat to, uh, you know, find those people in your life who, who are going to help you and then you help others as well. Uh, as far as mentoring, what about, uh, how do you like to give back, fam? Um, I'd like to give back in the way of what I'm doing right now. I really, truly enjoy helping new real estate investors get into it and pr- helping them through the process of planning and managing a, a, a renovation and trying to set up their per- real estate portfolio, you know, their real estate career, be on the groundwork and dealing and helping people. I really I enjoy that process and helping. And that's where I'm at in my stage in my life. I, I've got scars all over my body through the, you know, doing what I had to do to get to the point that I am. And I've a lot of sacrifices. And so right now I've re- entered a stage in my life where I really enjoy helping people. And, I, and there's a, such a joy that I get. I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. You, there's a joy when you help people out and they come back mm-hmm. to you and you say, thank you. And that thank you means so much. It's so genuine and so heartfelt that it just fuels me to go on and help more and more people. I really, I, I'm passionate about it. I really enjoy it. Van, it's been a pleasure to meet you. You've provided amazing value. I know the listeners and myself just thinking through this renovation process and even just the the, the st- stressing of having processes and systems. It doesn't matter if it's renovation or, or if it's acquisition or whatever it may be. Man, even if it's investor relations, you need to document processes. Our team is like uh, I've, I've tried to stress it so much to our team, like write it down, <laughs> you know, build that process so we can improve it and just constantly improve it every time we do it. Uh, and so thank you for that. Even thinking through, you know, do you have a goal for this? Do you, do you know what the budget is and how, where's that money going to come from? Uh, you know, and the needs and wants, I think that's interesting to think through a hey, roof 
hey, it may be a want, but or it may be a need, right? If if there's a hole. Um, so thinking through that and creating that scope of work. So thank you again. Tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. Well, I, the, probably the best place would be to go to my website. That's at vansturgeon.com. Um, I've got a bunch of information there from podcasts that I've been on to articles that have been picked up through Yahoo News, talking really specifically about real estate investing and, and renovations. Um, and and I've, I've got a, a free training video that I've created on my website that people are more than welcome to go. It sort of more elaborates the, the planning and management side of, the, of a renovation rehab and sort of lays the foundation for you being able to do it yourself successfully. I truly want to help people. I truly want to make sure that people, uh, you know, there's, I'm sure you may have come across that situation with me. We all have where you've hired a contractor trace person and, and they're supposed to show up one day. They didn't show up. And they're supposed to show up another day. They didn't show up and they're supposed to show up. And every time you wake up every morning, there's that pit in your stomach. There's that pit in your stomach where you're expecting that person to show up at your job site because, you know, monies are lots of monies are floating around that, that are you and, and, and that person doesn't show up. You know, that feeling, I want to help people avoid that feeling. And it's by setting up these systems and processes of really how to map part, successfully plan and manage your renovation, then you can avoid all of that. And you get control over your whole reno, you know, renovation and your whole investment. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.